Welcome to All Saints Church, Napperton, the lovely All Saints, here since probably the end of the 13th century in various forms, in pretty good shape, and we've even restored the tower. Uh, just welcome and enjoy coming into the church and enjoy seeing the things in it. In the churchyard, we don't know what happens in the churchyard. We don't know if people are buried here. We suspect they're not because it's all built on rock, very, very hard to um, dig through. The only person we know is buried is Mrs. Labouchere, surrounded by snowdrops, who bought the house in 1919 and lived here until she died in 1956. And she keeps coming up. You can see that it's not very stable, her, her tombstone. No, as far as we know, there may be other people buried here, but we certainly don't know. And we don't know why the ground here is so much higher than the passage there, different from there. It's all a muddle. It is a rather wonderful historical muddle of different periods, different styles, different people and different histories. So we'll go into the porch and then into the church. In the porch you'll see up there there's the little memorial that Richard Brodrip put up after he had changed, remodeled the church in country house style. So that's his. Then this doorway, I think is probably 19th century, there was a lot of remodelling of the, the church in 1846, and I suspect that is then. All this mess is house martins, and they nest up there. You can see their nests up there. There are four or five of them, and they swoop in and out. And if we have a service in the summer, they cut, and, we, and it's hot, we have the door open, and in come the house martins. So come on into the church. Welcome, welcome to Mapperton Church, the church, All Saints Mapperton, the parish church, uh, the centre of the village for some 800 years, and wonderful All Saints Mapperton. And I'm really pleased to be showing it to you because I love it and I love its atmosphere and I feel it's been such a really important part both of our family and of the parishioners of Mapperton over 800 years. Um, we have, of course, baptised children here, married a few off, and uh, had the funeral services for our parents and others and other relations. So also in the 35 years we've been here, it's been a central part of our living here. All Saints Mapperton has never been the chapel, quotes unquotes, of the house. It's always been the parish church of the village. And of course, the village is no longer as it sort of fell in in the plague in 1666, but the church has remained the parish church of the people and the farms who live around here. And indeed, we have a, we have a, a prayer that we say, which mentions all the adjacent farms, so that we're reminding ourselves of the people who live in this area. As far as the church itself is concerned, the first reference to it is in the late 13th century. And the first reference, of course, to the village is in the Doomsday Book. I don't think there's anything much left of the church of the late 13th century, although I'm told that the font is probably 13th century. And curiously enough, it was lost. And my father-in-law found it in the backyard when he bought the house in 1950s. And it's been put on a new stand. So maybe, maybe that's been there all the time. So what we really see in the church is a sort of medieval church with um, a chancel and pulpit and lectern and all the sort of normal things you have in an Anglican church. I personally have wanted to move the pews so that the church would be much more open and friendly, but my husband stopped me doing that. Um, the glass is, um, I think we'll come to later, but the glass is both Flemish 16th and 17th century. The uh, east window was put in, in, I think, by Mrs. Labouchere, who owned the house from the early 20th century until she died in, in her bed here in 1956. And the west window was put in for a young man who died aged 27 in 1850. It was remodelled by Richard Brodrip, who owned the estate and lived in the house in 1704. 
and actually did that just before he died. Very good thing to do. It might have helped him on his way up. Um, and then they, they carried on until the Comptons took over. The Comptons took over in the late 18th century and the Brodricks sort of petered out. And the Compton in the 19th century stayed as vicar here for 40 years. Heaven knows what he did. Uh, he, but one thing we do know is he made sure he didn't get his feet wet when he went to church because he put in a little room that linked the house with the church so he could trip in here. And my father-in-law bought it. Uh, he bought the building from the Diocese of Salisbury. But he didn't buy quite everything. He didn't buy the stained glass and he didn't buy the hassocks. And I don't think he bought the pews or the pulpit. And the stained glass got worse and worse and worse. Until one time, about 15 years ago, we invited the Bishop of Salisbury to tea it, with an entirely ulterior motive. Um, and, the, and I said to him, I think the stained glass is going to be extremely expensive for the diocese to repair. And unfortunately, it belongs to you and not to us. Um, oh, he said, would you like it? And so we got him a piece of A4 paper and a pen. And he wrote an elegant little letter saying, uh, Dear uh, John Sandwich, the diocese is going to give you anything in the church that at the present belongs to the diocese and it will be yours in perpetuity. And I said to his wife, why is he taking so long to write this? And she said, so he always spends all the, a lot of time looking at, at his handwriting, see if it's good enough. And so we and then, of course, had to pay for repairing the, the stained glass. But since then, it's become um, uh, um, uh, uh, all of it belongs to the estate. The tower is apparently the remains of a medi tiny medieval tower. Um, heaven knows when it turned into the stump it is, uh, which is a staircase. You can go up it. Um, and, um, and it's just been repointed, which is good, it means it's looking, it'll be better for the next 50 years. So that's part of the upkeep of this church. Um, but the more important uh, uh, use of the tower is for getting up above the roof of the church, above the ceiling of the church. We had to have it um, treated for death watch beetle about 25, 30 years ago. Um, and it was absolutely amazing. The whole of the floor of the church was sort of covered in beetles, death watch beetles, other beetles, wood lice, earwigs. So we reckoned that it really did its job. It clearly had modern tiles put on it about, I should think, in the 1950s. That window in the West End is really tiresome. It was put in to commemorate this young man of 27. And the left-hand side of it has the good Lord holding a staff. Now that staff create, ha, actually creates a, a weakness in the stained glass because it runs the whole way down. And one Christmas Eve it blew in in a gale and so we had to have that mended. We've had to have the stained glass mended. Um, what else have we had mended? Well, not much else actually. But of course, oh yes, that's right. And of course the ceiling nearly fell down in the West End about five years ago and we got a grant. Oh, in fact, we were very, very lucky since the church is privately owned to get a major grant from the Dorset Historic Churches Trust. And if we hadn't, it would have fallen in. And it was due to a leak above the windows which was working its way upwards. Please help support this important part of England's heritage by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Mapperton Live. And then of course, what we have done is we've put in a number of memorials. I think I said to you that the Brodrips in the 17th century were buried here. I think they were only probably buried in the vault here because Mapperton is seriously built on rock and it's really hard. However, my husband and I have put into our wills that we wish to be buried in the churchyard, um, which is going to mean that they're going to have to get, what are they called? Um, pneumatic drills. Pneumatic drills to uh, achieve this. We also tended, when we used to have even songs here, to forget to shut the door into the church and all the, and the dog would come in and the cats would come in. And that was very nice, actually. And now we have fewer services. And, of course, in a way, you know, what happens these days with headspace and mindful meditation is very similar to what was the people were doing when they were in church. I mean, 
an awful lot of the time they weren't listening to the liturgy or actually praying according to particular prayers. They were just thinking, oh my goodness, I haven't done the mashed potatoes. Oh dear, what am I going to do with so-and-so? And it was a time for people to be able to think through what they were doing. I was talking about this, the parish being um, uh, Roman Catholic until this fiery priest came along in uh, 1568. It had indeed been um, Roman Catholic and indeed had been a centre, well I don't know if it had been a centre but it had a very important Roman Catholic martyr called John Munden. There are a number of martyrs in Dorset who of the old faith, they were called recusants, recusant priests. He was a recusant priest, he came back to preach and to spread uh, the gospel in the Roman Catholic form. And he lived at a local farm called Coatley, which is just up the hill. A um, famous man. And he was caught, of course, and he was taken to London and he was burnt along with uh, the others. And there's a very fine memorial in Dorchester, where you to go there, by Elizabeth Frink to the, Dorchester, to the Dorset Martyrs, of which John London was one. In Dorset, it was particularly difficult, I think, because <coughs> as far as I understand it, um, some families were Roman Catholic, some were uh, uh, Protestant after the Reformation. Um, but it was very local, in the same way that during the Civil War, it was very local who were um, uh, for the King and who were for Cromwell. But what is interesting, I went, we went, used to go to a drinks party just before Christmas. This is not irrelevant. Uh, just before Christmas, in one of the great houses of Dorset, which is called Wolferton, near Dorchester. And it was owned by a, a man who is Protestant and his wife, who is one of the old Roman Catholic families of Dorset, from the Roman Catholic families of Dorset. And I met a man there who said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, until after the First World War, uh, Roman Catholic families and Protestant families never danced together. And it was only the effect of losing so many of the young men in the First War that it brought together the two, uh, the two strands of Christianity in this area. Life must have been really appalling here, really awful. But there was great turmoil in the Reformation. I would think that you'll be talking about this when you're uh, talking about the house, but the Morgan family were very split, and one of the Morgans killed his brother-in-law in a quarrel after dinner, which was probably about religion, uh, and then he was hung. And the, I think that the Brodritts, by the time the Brodritts came, they were Protestant, because they were always, um, as far as I could see, local county gentry doing sort of local worthy things and they couldn't have been doing that if they were Roman, still Roman Catholic. And then in the 19th century this had obviously evaporated. What we've usually uh, had in services here over the last 40 years, we've usually had uh, obviously a Christmas service, a carol service, um, Easter service and of course a Harvest Festival. And Harvest Festival has always meant a lot um, the, the service and the harvest supper afterwards have always meant a lot in this agricultural community. And we've decorated the church and uh, we've, you know, brought in all, all the inevitable pumpkins and marrows and uh, apples and stuff. But then we used to have Evensong uh, once a month in the summer and people really used to like coming to it. But of course things have changed. The people who used to come have left the village and there are fewer people and we don't know them so well and much, many fewer people go to church. So we've really stopped having Evensong um, and we try to have the odd service once a year. We've also used the church for baptisms in the family have been great here. Um, Jemima was married here, Luke and Julia were married here. Um, and then other parishioners have been married here, which has kept it going as a local church with a local community. One of the ways we've used the church has been uh, to have concerts here. We haven't had that many, and it sort of started in a rather ad hoc way when somebody came to stay and their partner was a, mu a professional musician, and so we had a small concert. And then we got to know one or two sort of well-known musicians. 
And I reckoned and I realised that they have a really quite arduous lifestyle. They're always on tour, they're going around the world, they hardly have any kind of quotes unquote home life and weekends off. So I thought that if I, we invited them here, they did a concert, but they spent the weekend with us and we cooked and they had time off. Um, it might be rather nice for them. And this worked extremely well with a cellist called Stephen Islis, who played all his bar, uh, the Bach um, cello suites here in two concerts and, played, and has played probably four or five times here. And he, he and his wife and son would come and stay. His son was very young when they first came and thought he owned the place. It was absolutely sweet. He used to tell us what to do. Little Gabriel. And um, so we had a cello with Stephen. And then for some reason we knew Mark Padmore. Um, and he used to come and he sang Schubert, he sang Winterreiser, Schöner Müllerin, um, he sang the Beethoven and die Ferne Geliebte, various concerts. The year before, we had a very ni nice group organised by a, a, a violinist called Cathy Gars. We had Matthew Hunt as the cellist playing the Brahms quintet and some other music. The thing is, that as soon as these, the, the audience comes into the church, the acoustics soften, and you can see these guys who are playing at that end. We take down the altar rail and take out the altar and they play up there. You can see them sort of relaxing as they feel the acoustics are going right. Mm -hmm.